So we're, uh, before we dig into this, just a little bit of a recap of where we are in the story of Exodus right now to help us stand, understand what we're going to talk about today. So God's people, the Israelites, were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, right? And then God sends Moses to be their rescuer. Moses brings them out of Egypt, and they're going through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And in this time in the wilderness, a lot has happened. They've uh, been fed manna from heaven. God parted the Red Sea, and they walked through the middle of it, which is pretty amazing, uh, they were given water out of a rock, like literally Moses hits a rock and water comes out to be able to give the people water and hydration in the midst of the desert. Uh, all this crazy stuff has gone on. Now they've gone uh, to the base of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is this place where God is meeting with Moses. So we've talked about this a couple of times. Moses has gone up and back down, up and back down, up and back down. And every time he goes up, he gets a message from God and he brings that message back down to the people to communicate to them. So God gave Moses the Ten Commandments up there. He gave Moses the other 603 laws up there on Mount Sinai. And last week, Wars taught us that he gave Moses the instructions for the tabernacle and how the tabernacle was supposed to look, the lampstand, the altar, the holy place, the most holy place, all of those instructions God gave Moses. And immediately following that, he gives Moses instructions for something called the priesthood. The priesthood uh, was going to be selected uh, by God and ordained by God uh, right after the tabernacle. So once the tabernacle has been built, the place where the presence of God is going to dwell, there needs to be people uh, who kind of run the tabernacle. Uh, what we would know kind of like in church today, it's not the same thing, but a similar example would be like pastors who help run the church. Uh, there's priests who are helping to run the tabernacle um, and maintain it the way that God has designed. And every detail of the priesthood is pointing to the character of God. God is trying to help his people understand more of his character through something like this. I know we've talked about this every week in Exodus, but the point of all of these stories is God is revealing more of himself to his people. That's the purpose. He's trying to help his people understand his character and who he is and what he does, not just to give them practical things that are gonna help them in their life. This is all pointing to a greater picture. It all lines up. And uh, something that can help us process this a little bit. Um, how many of you guys watched the whole Obi-Wan Kenobi series? Anybody really into it? Okay, so I was uh, glued to this. I started a little bit late. Like the first, I think, five episodes were already out when I first started watching, which I'm glad I did it that way because once one ended, I was like, I don't have to wait. I get to watch the next one. And it was so good. And one of the, my favorite parts of this series, I won't give anything away. But one of my favorite parts is the way that they develop these characters. And obviously, we know the stories of the movies and what happens in episodes four, five, and six. So we know, like, some of the things that happens in the future. We know things that happened in the past, but they take that time in between, and they develop these characters even more. Characters like Obi-Wan and Vader and Leia, like, they, they start to be formed and shaped into the characters that we know in the later movies. And it all lines up. Like when they say certain things, you're like, oh, I get why they would say that because that happens in episode five. Or, you know, oh, I get why they say that because in Revenge of the Sith, this happens. Like there's so many cool things that happen in the course of a lot of these movies um, that's verified in the show. And it's a prequel to some of the later movies where it all just adds up and all the characters make sense. And I think that's what was so intriguing to me is how everything comes together. And reading through a story like this in Exodus, God almost gives the priesthood as a prequel to what would happen later on in the life of Christ. And all of the character development that's happening through the book of Exodus, through the priesthood, is developing the character of God that's going to be further confirmed when the great high priest Jesus shows up to fulfill the entire Old Testament. Does that make sense? So all this stuff is giving us a picture and an image. Now, the reason why the priesthood is so important and the reason why God had to establish priests in the tabernacle is because, remember, the people couldn't just enter freely into the presence of God. You remember Mount Sinai when they tried to approach the mountain? God said, get back. <laughs> he said, stand back, because he's holy, and we're not. He's perfect. We can't just walk freely into the presence of God in all of his holiness and perfection. Like, there's price to be paid for that. You can't just waltz into God's presence. Like, he's too holy for us sinners to fully embrace. So God is here and we're here. The reason why the priesthood exists and these priests would work in the tabernacle is because there has to be a mediator between those two. 
So if God is holy and we are sinful, there has to be mediators that bridge the gap. And that's what the priests were. The priesthood is established because they were called to be mediators between God and his people. To make that relationship possible. The only way that relationship could happen is if there was a mediator in between. And Moses calls uh, Aaron and brings him as the first priest. God said, I've chosen Aaron. He didn't get to choose this. Aaron and his sons were selected specifically by God to be the first priests that serve in the, tabernacle, to, in the tabernacle and to be the first mediators between God and his people. And if you remember some of the, the tabernacle, the way that it was set up, uh, there was the outer courts that everyone could enter. The altar was there, the altar of sacrifice. Um, and then there was the holy place and the most holy place that were under kind of this tent inside that was called the tent of meeting. And so the only people that were allowed to enter the tent of meeting to actually meet with God were the priests. And so the priests play a really, really vital role in the relationship that the people have with God because they're the only ones that can actually enter his presence. The priests are the only people that are allowed to walk into God's presence to be the mediator and meet with him in that tent of meeting. And so uh, Exodus 28 to 30 uh, summarizes a lot of different details about the priests, what they would wear, what they would do. And so I'm going to summarize a little bit of it for you. Um, And the first part of uh, Exodus 28 goes through the preparation process for what a priest was supposed to do. Listen to how intense this process of preparation is for the Aaron and his sons just to become a priest. All right, so this is just their initial, like, um, I almost said hazing. That's not the right word. <laughs> like, this is their preparation. This is the way that they're being consecrated. This is what the Bible calls it. This is their consecration to become priests. Listen to this. They were cleansed through a ceremonial washing in front of the people in which they removed their clothes as a sign of saying, I'm putting off my sin. And they were washed with water outside the temple before they even walked in to that tabernacle area as a sign that they were being ceremonially washed and cleansed. Next, they were given the priestly garments, the clothes, and we'll talk about what those are in a minute. And they were anointed with oil, which is a sign in the Bible of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So they're given the priestly garments, they're anointed with oil. And then they took part in three different sacrifices. There was a sin offering, a burnt offering, and a wave offering. And when these offerings were to take place, they would lay their hands, the priest would lay their hands on the head of the animal. Now, it sounds kind of strange, but there's a reason why they would do this. Part of the consecration of a priest is their their sin, their transgressions, because they're imperfect people too, is being transferred to that animal and being paid for. So before the priest would initiate sacrifices for the people, there were sacrifices that had to be made for them. And they would lay their hands on this animal as it's killed. And even after it was killed, they would take some of the blood from the animal and sprinkle it onto the priest, which also sounds strange. But the reason why this is happening is it's a sign and it's a symbol that they're being covered by the blood of this animal, that their transgressions are being paid for before they can offer sacrifices and be a mediator for the people. And this happened for an entire week. Every day they would take part in these sacrifices for a whole week to prepare them. And that's just the beginning. Once they actually became priests, they had a lot of different purposes that they would accomplish in the temple. There was a a lampstand that had to be lit at all times. It was a sign that the presence of God was always in the tabernacle. So that lamp always had to be burning. And one of the priest's jobs was to make sure that was happening. There was incense that was burned in the temple. And that incense always had to be burning over and over and over again, 24-7. Day and night, there was incense that was burning in the tabernacle to show God's presence, to reveal his presence to his people. And Aaron and his sons had to follow these instructions so perfectly. Like they, they had to follow all the the requirements that God had given them for the priesthood. And one of those requirements was what they wore. So the priestly garments uh, consisted of a lot of different things. There's a picture to help us see what this might've looked like. Uh, One of the things that they wore was an ephod, which is kind of like a vest. Uh, They had a long blue robe that they would wear. That thing on their chest is called a breastplate. Um, And that breastplate was kind of like a, a, a symbol. It had 12 different stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, They had a turban that they wore on their head, and uh, on the turban was a gold plate that had an inscription that said, holy to the Lord. So every time that uh, they would enter into the service of the Lord, they had this symbol. Uh, 
um, a reminder to them that everything that they did, everything their eyes saw, everywhere that they went was holy to the Lord, the work that they were doing. This was a really, really serious thing. And all the sacrifices they would make was part of their regulation. So as a priest, uh, you made two sacrifices a day. There were two animals um, that you would sacrifice to the Lord as an offering to him, one in the morning and one in the evening. And these rituals almost became like uh, part of the worship of the Jewish people. And uh, the morning sacrifice in some ways was kind of like what we would know today as morning devotions. Like they would go to the tabernacle and the priest would offer the sacrifice in the morning. And this was a way for God's people to meet with him. In Exodus 29, uh, this is how it's described uh, by God. The reason why all of these requirements, all the sacrifices, all the priestly garments, this is why it matters. And this is why it's so important. God says, for the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. And then these next few words is the reason why all this is established. There I will meet you and speak to you. There also I will meet with the Israelites and the place will be consecrated by my glory. So if you're wondering the reason why the priests have to wear all these garments, the reason why they go through a week-long preparation process, the reason why they have to make all these sacrifices is because God wants to meet with his people. God is interested in meeting with them, to have a relationship with them, to talk with them, to speak to them. And the only way that's possible is through sacrifice, through a mediator, someone who can be cleansed and declared holy and righteous and enter into his presence. And they have to do it right. Like they had to follow the instructions perfectly. And there was actually consequences if they didn't. And this is best seen through the yearly sacrifice that the high priest would have to make. So uh, inside the tabernacle, there was the tent of meeting, which consisted of the holy place. But then inside the holy place was the most holy place. And the way that this worked is on the day of atonement every year, the high priest would enter into the most holy place and offer sacrifice. So he would take the sacrifice from the altar and he would go into the most holy place. And this is where the Ark of the Covenant was. If you remember from last week, War showed us a picture. It was kind of that, that box where there was two angels, uh, two seraphim with their wings extending to the middle of it. That was called the mercy seat. And this is believed to be the actual place where the presence of God dwelled. And so there, this high priest, one time a year, this is the only time anyone is allowed inside the most holy place. He would enter in with blood from a sacrifice. And think about the significance of this. He would sprinkle it onto the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Like, why is he sprinkling blood onto this wooden box? It was, it was a way to, to cleanse himself as he entered into the presence of God. But think about what's happening. He's sprinkling the blood of a sacrifice onto the, the mercy seat, the place where God and his presence is. Sprinkling the blood onto the presence of God, onto God himself, as a picture of the later sacrifice that would come through Jesus. And as he would enter into this place, he had to follow every instruction carefully. And if you want to read uh, Exodus 28 through 31, you can see some of these detailed instructions. But one of the parts of the priestly garments is they had these uh, gold bells on the bottom of their robe. And so whenever they walked, uh, these bells would kind of ring and they would jingle. And one of the purposes for this is that when the high priest, when Aaron uh, would enter into the most holy place once a year, uh, they would actually tie a rope around his leg and stand outside. Because if the high priest didn't follow the instructions carefully, then he might be struck dead in the presence of God. And if they didn't hear those bells ringing for a little while, they might pull on that rope and pull out a dead priest because he didn't follow the instructions exactly the way that God had told him to, or he didn't have reverence for the presence of God the way that he should. And it might sound a little bit savage, but the purpose for why God is doing this is because he takes the mediator very, very seriously. If someone is going to mediate between God and his people, God says they have to do it right. They have to do it the way that I have called them to. And even the details of how they're supposed to sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, everything that happens when I'm meeting with my mediator has to be done on my terms. And it has to be done right because all of this is a picture. All of this is a shadow pointing to Christ. So it has to be done correctly. The priest had to be faithful. 
They had to take their service to the Lord very seriously. They had to do things right. They had to be honest. They couldn't be liars. They couldn't be stealing. And unfortunately, the story of the priesthood in most of the Old Testament is a story of failure and unfaithfulness and corruption and disappointment. I mean, the priests in the Old Testament, if you read some of these stories, like these dudes were corrupt. There were some good ones and there were some that took advantage of people. They didn't have reverence for the sacrifices in the tabernacle. They didn't serve the Lord the way they should. They didn't honor the Lord. They sought their own gain, their own way. And there were consequences for their actions. So much so, Ezekiel 8 through 10 says that the presence and the glory of God actually left the temple. That's how seriously God takes his mediator. The person that's going to go meet with him on behalf of the people, they have to do it right. Because the people's relationship with God, think about it, literally depends on the faithfulness of the mediator. They can't walk into the most holy place, into God's presence. If you were just an Israelite back then, you couldn't walk past the outer courts. Like You couldn't even go into the holy place, much less the most holy place where God dwelled. There was a massive veil separating the most holy place from even the holy place inside that tent of meeting. You couldn't go past that curtain. Like you could not pass that area. Once a year, one guy was allowed to enter in, and that was it. And they had to do it right. Because the relationship that God had with his people depended on the mediator. And the same is true for us today. Our relationship with God is completely dependent on the faithfulness of the mediator. We're still sinful, right? God's still holy, right? So there still has to be mediation. There still has to be someone that goes in between God and us to be able to bridge that gap of relationship. And this is what leads us to Zechariah chapter 3. All right, so if you have your Bible, turn to Zechariah 3. And in this vision that Zechariah has, he's going to give this prophecy that helps us to understand the purpose of why all these things happen, right? Zechariah 3, starting in verse 1. Zechariah is describing what he saw. It says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. And then the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? So God is essentially saying, this is a sinful man, but I've chosen him as my high priest. I've consecrated him. I've sanctified him for this work. Now look at verse 3. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. And then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. And then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. Think about what's happening here. This is reenacting the preparation and consecration ceremony for a priest. So this high priest Joshua that Zechariah is having a vision of, he would have known this ceremony really well. He would have known what this was. This was preparing a priest for the work of the Lord. But something's a little bit different about it. Satan is there to accuse him and the Lord rebukes Satan and removes his filthy clothes and and consecrates him and prepares him for this work. And then it takes a shift in verse six. Look at what the angel of the Lord says. It says, the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among those standing here. So this is very similar charge to what the priests were supposed to do. It's supposed to be obedient. They're supposed to do all the requirements the right way. But then in verse 8, listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant, the branch, and see the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. And I will remove the sin of the land in a single day. And in that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. So what's actually happening here? This high priest Joshua is brought before the Lord. 
He says he's a stick snatched from the fire that God's chosen him to be a high priest. And he says, Joshua, you and all the other priests that are serving with you are symbolic of things to come. And even though throughout the entire Old Testament, the priesthood failed over and over again, these men that were supposed to serve the Lord in obedience and righteousness and do the right thing, they failed and they failed and they failed. And they were a disappointment after disappointment, after corruption, after bribery, after theft, like literally stealing from God. Even though they were unfaithful, God says, I'm going to give you a promise. This amazing promise that a new priesthood is coming. He says, you priests are just symbolic of the things which are to come. That one day there's going to be a high priest that is not going to fail. There's going to be a priesthood that's established that is going to last forever. And he calls the Messiah the branch. He's going to be this this new line, this new priesthood. And if this high priest Joshua is a stick snatched from the fire, this is a branch and a vine that will grow and that will feed and nourish everybody else. And it says that even though that high priest could walk into the most holy place and pay for the sins of the people for the previous year, this high priest Jesus would take away the sins of the world in a single day. Think about the gravity of that statement. In the Old Testament, talking about Jesus, saying in a single day, the sins of the people will be completely wiped out. The high priest once a year could enter into the most holy place and make a sacrifice that would cover the previous year of sins for the people, which is kind of cool, a whole year covered in one sacrifice through the sin of an animal. But Jesus, our great high priest, walked in with his own blood to cover the sins past, present, and future of anyone who would ever trust in him. Think about the power of that statement that Zechariah is making, that he will cover and remove their sins in a single day. That what was happening at the cross was greater than anything that any priest could ever accomplish. And if you look at the life and ministry of Jesus, the things that he did, the things that he said. All of it is pointing to this consecration ceremony, this preparation for a high priest. Jesus is fulfilling what the high priest was always meant to be. Think about even little details of the process. So a priest would have to remove their clothes and be cleansed with water. What's the first thing Jesus does before he begins his earthly ministry? He goes to the Jordan River. And he's brought down into the water and he's baptized. And Jesus didn't need to repent or be cleansed of anything, but in some ways he's taking part in a preparation ceremony for a high priest that's about to go into service for his father. When Jesus was hanging on a cross, it's a symbol of the sacrifice on the altar that paid for the sins of the people. And just like a high priest would take a bowl of the blood from the sacrifice into the most holy place and sprinkle it onto the Ark of the Covenant, the blood of Jesus was poured out and sprinkled onto a wooden cross to pay the ultimate sacrifice that wouldn't be temporary to take away sins for a year, but every single sin of every person who would trust in Christ for an entire lifetime was dealt with once and for all at the cross. Zechariah 3 was being fulfilled at the cross of Jesus Christ. It was the culmination of this prophecy and this promise that one day the branch would come. They would take away the sins of the land in a single day. Hebrews 8 says that the the tabernacle and all of its instructions is a shadow of what exists in heaven, which leads us to believe that there's a tabernacle set up in heaven, a meeting room with God, not where the Ark of the Covenant is that represents the presence of God, but God himself in the throne room, in the most holy place. 
and think about what was happening in the spiritual realm when Jesus went to the cross. We know what was physically happening. On the outside, it looked like there's this rogue preacher who was going around spreading lies and deception and getting people to follow this new gospel and this new way of life. On the outside, it looks like that's what's happening. And the religious leaders, you know, collaborating with the Romans to put him to death to end everything that he stood for. Like on the outside, it's what it looks like. But in the spiritual realm, what's actually happening is Jesus, our great high priest, was entering the most holy place for us. Think about this. Through the blood of the sacrifice and not of an animal, but his own blood being shed, Jesus is entering into the most holy place in heaven. And I just, I picture Jesus with the, the scars on his hands and his feet the stripes on his back from the lashes being beaten and whipped over and over and over again, entering into the most holy place before God. And just like a, a high priest would sprinkle the blood in God's presence and say, this is enough. This blood is enough to cover the people for an entire year of their sins. Jesus Christ enters that most holy place and says, this is enough. The last words that he said on the cross, it is finished. It's done. We no longer need to sacrifice for the sins of the previous year or the previous day. This sacrifice lasts once and for all. And the blood of Jesus has been laid before the throne of the Father in heaven. And he said, it is enough. It covers everything. Every sin that you will ever commit has been dealt with at the cross by Jesus Christ. And something powerful happened when Jesus breathed his last breath on that cross. The Bible says that the veil in the temple was torn in two. That curtain that separated everyone from the presence of God has been removed. And the Bible says very specifically that it was torn from top to bottom. And I never really understood the significance of why that was. It was like, why did it have to be torn from top to bottom? But the reality is there's a reason God did it that way. It was to show that God was the one who tore it. That he made his way to us. And not only did Jesus pay that sacrifice on the cross and enter the most holy place in heaven, he turned around and walked back out and ripped the veil in half and said, no longer are the days where once a year one high priest can enter into my presence. This presence of God is available for everyone now. Anyone who will put their faith and trust in Jesus can enter into the most holy place and commune with their maker, can talk to the God of the universe like the access that you have to God, even the high priests of Israel would look at in envy to say you can access him every day. You can pray to God the Father. You can even call him Father. We had to wait once a year for just the high priest to enter into his presence and tie a rope around the dude's leg. Because if he didn't do something right, God would strike him dead. And yet you can talk to him every hour of every day because not only did Jesus pay with his blood on the cross, he turned around, walked out, ripped the veil in two and said, anyone else is invited in. And he rose again from the dead to come back and tell us that the way has been made open. The kingdom of God is available to you. The most holy place where the presence of God dwells, you now have access to. I now have access to. Jesus has made a way. And throughout the New Testament, we see these pictures of a new high priest and a new priesthood that has been established that gives us access to the Father. And I want to close with a verse from 1 Peter. And the way Peter puts this, I think, sums up the incredible relationship that we have with God through Christ. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, 
God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. If those Israelites would have looked on at a, a phrase like this and thought it was blasphemy that we would be called the royal priesthood. That all those who trust in Christ are called priests. Think about this. You are a priest of God. I know that might sound a little strange, but it's true. If you've put your faith in Christ, you are a royal priesthood. That because of our great high priest, our mediator, Jesus, who went into the most holy place before us and turned around and opened the curtain, he invites us in. And now we have access to God. We're considered worthy to enter into his presence. And the question I want to leave you with is, do you? Jesus tore the veil in two so that you could have relationship with God so that you could enter in to the most holy place. Do you? Do you enter in? Do you meet with your creator? Because he extends his hand to you. And every single day, not just once a year, not just once a week, every day he wants to meet with you. Will you enter in?